This is Twit. There's been some crazy. There's been some crazy things going on on the sun. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a, a level G4 solar storm. They only go up to five. So this was huge. It was the biggest, biggest solar storm of this cycle. And normally we do the Newsline report here, but we're not going to do that tonight because we have Dr. Tamitha Scove's full report. And in fact, this, this information is so fresh. She was up all night last night looking at Aurora from this thing. The Aurora went very, very far south. Um, we literally just got this report three minutes ago. So I haven't seen it. Uh, we're all going to watch it together. And here is astrophysicist Dr. Tamitha Scove with a very important solar report right now. Hi, I'm Tamitha Scove with your solar storm forecast for the week of March 19th. Space weather activity has kicked into high gear this week, and it's all due to region 2297. You can see it here. It's kicked off more than 10 M-class flares and an X2.2. You can see it right there. And that X2.2 destroyed amateur radio communication for literally hours. The bands were nothing but static. Now, the region quieted down when it reached center disk. It really wasn't that eruptive. But then you saw this filament here that started getting really unstable that was right next to it. And then it bifurcated and then finally erupted in this dragon snake kind of configuration. It looked like literally a dragon head, as you can see here. And that eruption, along with another filament that erupted, kind of combined in the solar wind. And when it actually reached Earth, it caused a G4-class geomagnetic storm. But more about that in a minute. Switching to our M-flare threat meter, you can see the M-flare started back on March 6th. We had that X2.2 on the 11th, and the flares just kept coming. We almost had an M-flare right here. There's that long-duration M-flare. That's where that dragon snake eruption happened, and that actually caused a proton radiation storm as well from the solar storm that was coming towards Earth, which ended up hammering high latitudes on top of the flares, uh, so it caused problems for GPS navigation and amateur radio operation up until that storm hit Earth. Switching to our solar storm levels, you can see we've been hovering at unsettled to quiet conditions for a number of days, and that included a couple solar storm fizzles that just didn't have the right configuration until, wait for it, Bam! Do you see that right there? That is one of the top five solar storms that have occurred in Solar Cycle 24. This storm was so strong that it absolutely annihilated the ham radio operator bands. It also caused GPS issues. I got a couple people reporting in there. And we have an unconfirmed report of an amateur radio operator getting shocked from his antenna during the storm. And this massive storm caused gorgeous rainbow aurora all over the world, including places like Estonia, and we had gorgeous coronas in Sweden and also in Scotland, gorgeous rainbow aurora in Ireland, and Lancaster, Northumberland, and Cumbria in the UK. We also had gorgeous aurora in Hamburg, Germany, and it reached clear down to France. Now, we also had aurora in Iceland. This is before the storm and during the storm. We also had aurora all over the United States that reached clear down to Colorado, but here's some from uh, Illinois. And then the Aurora Australis, we had New Zealand and also in Perth, Australia. That's incredibly high latitude for Aurora to be seen. This is incidentally also the place where that ham radio operator was reported to get shocked and when we also heard reports of power fluctuations. So what does the sun do for an encore? Well, this is Stereo A. It's our backside monitor. You can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun from behind. And when you look at the back side of the sun, it's actually quite busy. It's really complicated. We've got region 2290, which is now rotated Earth side. We've renamed that 2303. But you can see there's a lot of other really complicated structures on the backside, but not a lot of, of flare activity. So we don't have any contenders like 2297. We're expecting that we probably are going to be looking more at uh, high-speed wind from coronal streams over the next few days. Returning to the disk, you can see region 2297 is finally rotating off to the west limb. Now, it has diminished somewhat, but it is still an M-flare contender. On top of that, it has finally moved into a position where it actually gives us a higher risk for proton radiation storms, so we can expect uh, the possibility of that to be increasing over the next few days. Now, region 2302 also is beginning to grow rapidly, and it may become a flare contender, but it only has a couple days before it's out of Earth view. Other than that, we only have region 2303, which is coming onto the disk, and it is not really a big player at this time, but we'll be sure to be watching it. 
Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming days. Even though we are officially outside a solar storm, we are now under the influence of a high-speed solar wind. What's compounding that is the fact that we're in a magnetic sector that actually has a lot of southward pointing field. And all of this combined is causing this magnetic storm to kind of the effects of it to kind of linger. As a matter of fact, right now we are still in a G2 class solar storm. So what Noah is saying is that we should have about a 45% chance of a major storm at high latitudes over the coming days and about a 30% chance of active conditions at mid latitudes. But that actually might be an underestimate considering these compounding conditions. We might actually see more storming over the next day or two, even at mid latitudes. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming days, NOAA is giving us about a 40% chance for an M-class flare over the next day or so until region 2297 rotates behind the west limb. As far as particle radiation storms are concerned, though, we've got about a 30% chance because of the location of where 2297 is. Once it rotates out of sight, that chance will diminish significantly. Now one last thing I'd like to mention is that there is going to be a total solar eclipse of the sun on the 20th. So if you happen to be in Iceland or in Africa or in Eurasia, anywhere you see the shadow region here, you do have a chance to check it out in person. So don't miss it. So this week has been an absolute buzz of activity. I want to thank amateur radio operator KC7RUN and all of the amateur radio operators out there who have reported into him not only during the X-Class flare but also during that huge geomagnetic storm we just finished having. Your tireless efforts are so important to me. I also want to thank all the uh, Aurora photographers and all the field reporters out there who have been reporting into me on Twitter uh, from what they see and what they don't see. Your reports are what make this community so incredibly vibrant and timely, and I am just incredibly honored to be a part of it. Meanwhile, we still have some solar storm lingering issues that may last for the next couple days. So you still could see some GPS, some ham radio issues, and uh, other might even get a chance for more aurora at high latitudes over the coming days. But then take some rest over the weekend because things should be quieting down. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Dr. T. And she's watching, by the way, tonight. I've been uh, talking to her via Twitter during the first half of the show. We were waiting for this to upload. She literally just finished it. And so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sko, for being part of, of, of Ham Radio. This is just so cool. I want you to, you need to follow her on, on Twitter, at Tamitha Scove and spaceweather.tv. Um, if you if you poke around in there, I believe if you go to educational resources, I think if you click on that, there's some neat uh, uh, neat videos. Uh, scroll on down. Yeah, the Carrington comparison, right there. That that compares what we just went through to something that happened in 1856, I believe it was, which was the largest. Uh, thing which is about nine times bigger, I think, than what we had now. Which, if this would have happened today, the care if the Carrington event would have happened today, uh, there could very well have been year-long power outages on the East Coast. Um, satellites uh, would have been pretty much rendered useless. So you need to go go check out the Carrington event. This was just an amazing thing where literally. Uh, telegraphers, this is back in, in the 1850s with, with, uh, with Morse code and the telegraph, they were literally, telegraphers were actually being shocked and sparks were flying from their code keys and actually setting some papers on fire. The, the auroras were so bright as far down as Cuba that people were actually reading the newspaper at night and people were waking up thinking it was daytime in the middle of the night and going out and going to work and then realizing what time it was and saying, what in the hell is going on? So this is, this is just... Go watch this when you when you have time. Uh, the Carrington comparison, just absolutely amazing stuff. So again, uh, Doctor T, we're so happy to have you here, and and I'm just honored to be your friend and and colleague in this. So we're doing our best to educate about solar weather.